Hi, I'm Diane. Um, I live in Harvey Bay, which is a coastal uh, city in southeast Australia. Um, today I'll be discussing free non-fiction and free fiction books that um, that are just some of the books that, that help inspire me. Uh, this is in regards to a story MOOC um, activity for the week. Um, the requirement was free, but I decided to go free of each because, well, I I have a very eclectic uh, eclectic reading um, habit. So, well, the first one I'll be the first book I'll be discussing is *Black Mist* and other Japanese futures. This is an anthology edited by Orson Scott Card and Keith Farrell. It's got a very strong cyberpunky feel. The stories have a bit of diversity in them as well, in, in the general themes uh, that you'll see in, in the book, throughout the book itself. I highly recommend it for anybody with an interest in science fiction and cyberpunk sort of themes. And of course, you have the, the very Eastern feel to the stories itself, as the name already suggests. Time to move on to the next book. This is The Hollowing by Robert Holstock. It's a fantasy book set during the 60s in a small English town where there's a boy who goes missing. The, the story itself centers or predominantly follows his father. Uh, the father thinks his son is dead, but he discovers sometimes uh, fairly um, a bit later in, in the timeline that his son is not dead and that the wood has faked his son's death by creating a, a tree version of the sun that, to make it look like the boy. <laughs> the son's now trapped in the wood and his fears and whatnot are manifesting in monsters coming from the woods itself. It's got a lot of good story to, um, uh, storytelling to it, but you'll find that it's a bit slow. Uh, for the first 100, uh, 100 pages, it's dealing with the events before the, the son gets captured. It's, uh, uh, and yeah, just all these very, very strange events, like the timeline is very wonky. They, they can go in... Um, into the woods at one, st uh, one time and then when they return it's like three months before they, they left in the first place. So they've got to negotiate these, uh, these odd properties of the woods. There's also this, um, this understanding that this is not the only wood in, uh, forest in the world where these events are happening. It's not an isolated phenomenon. And you'll see lots of mythological and, um, characters popping up the kid keeps on bringing out monsters, obviously, but anybody who's around the area, if they um, are thinking a lot about a particular hero of mythology, that hero will probably manifest based on the strength of their thoughts. It's a pretty good um, book itself. It's the first of two books that I've got that are, um, that are set in Shadowhawks Wood, and that's... The original character, I believe this is the original cover. It's an older book. I really, really loved it. I found it in a, a bookstore, and as you can see, it's a little bit worn. The sun's got to it a bit. Papers have gone a bit brown. I love that. It's still got a little bit of freshness to it, which is kind of odd given how much, I, how much um, I've done to it. Um, and this, I, I know this is it's supposed to be free books, but this is like, you can't have one without the other. The High House and the False House by James Stoddard. Uh, I got these books from the same bookstore, uh, bookshop um, in a town nearby. It's um, about a young man who's tasked with this job of taking, out, uh, taking care of the, what's termed as a high house. It's a a building where um, it runs, uh, whoever maintains it will affect the world around it. So um, 
if the clock isn't turned on a, on the predestined um, time frame, the universe will blow up and things like that. It's got a lot of uh, fantasy um, aspects to it. It is basically a fantasy. Um, if you like C.S. Lewis, you'll probably like uh, see some influences in the books um, of that author. Uh, I really dig James Dotto's writing. This was a uh, this was a little bit of an excursion for me, uh, and from a an RPG um, point of view, I could see a lot of. Well, there was a few monsters in there that I uh, thought was kind of cool, like the the mimics. There was also these tiger things. Now, um, some of you might be familiar with the the term mimic <laughs> from from say D and D, and they are somewhat close to that sort of. They do actually rep, um, pretend that there's something else. Uh, um, when we first see the, the mimics in the high house, um, they pretend that they are pieces of furniture. So they pretend they're chairs and whatnot. By the time that the false house um, comes around, they are becoming more humanoid. So they're evolving. Now, the first book deals with the main character um, getting used to the, the the rules of the house and he has to deal with the monsters negotiating certain entities. In the second book it goes further into detail about two entities that he encounters in the um, the first book. Um, there's I believe it's Old Man Chaos and there's Lore. The, these char these are basically extremes. They, they don't really deal in in terms of good and evil. Although they, there are definitely notions of that in these two entities, there are significant. Um, they they will do anything to get what they want. Because of the extremes, um, and dealing with the love issue that the main character has to deal with. Um, so that's. The High House and the False House by James Stoddard. And time to begin dealing with the next lot. This is the first of the, the non-fiction books that I'll be discussing. It is The Story of a Novel by Thomas Wolfe. Uh, he's an author that died fairly young and he had, I think it was about five or six works. Um, as I said, he died fairly young. This was written about two or three years before he died. It was originally published in 1926, I believe it was. This particular version was published in 1936, uh, about 10 years later, obviously. Unfortunately, some wasps got to it after um, the cover was removed and the, a little bit of a dirt dauber there. I believe that's what some people call it. Um, it deals predominantly with the publishing of his first book. Um, for anybody who's unaware of Thomas Wolfe, he wrote a book that was about a million pages long. He deals with that particular book. It wasn't published as that long a, a book. Uh, this deals with a little bit of, of the uh, what was happening to him at the time, his social, um, the so, uh, social um, inspirations that he had, basically little things that were happening to him while he's write, writing this. Um, and yeah, he had to go for a lot of editing to get it down, uh, get that book down to a reasonable amount. I believe it ended up being three separate books. I'll have to look that back up again. The next book is The Immortal Man, um, Funerary Rites and Customs by C.E. Vuliami. I hope that's pronounced right. This is a book about, well, the similarities that different cultures have had um, in regards to life and death. Uh, Things like the, the significance of the colour red, um, that sort of thing. Um, how people bury the, their loved ones, how they deal with funerals, for example, why, they, uh, why certain people do not speak ill of the dead. This is on, this, this really significant, um, this is focus on the similar similarities we have uh, as a whole as the human race, regardless of where we live in the world. It's a particularly good book. I highly recommend it. It was originally, 
Actually, that's correct. It, this was the one that was, um, I believe this was a, yeah, this was originally published in 1926, not the other one. Um, it was published as Immortal Man. Uh, let's see if there's any other in, yeah. Uh, and, and this one was obviously um, printed a lot later, 1997. Uh, that was around the same time I've actually got a copy of this, so uh, it was fairly new. I saw it at a bookstore, the same bookstore as I got some of those other books. I took an immediate interest in it because, I, well, it seemed like an odd topic. I ended up re um, reading the the whole of the book in between large amounts of gardening. I would go out and do some gardening and uh, and read a chapter of this, or maybe multiple and certain breaks um, while I was just having a uh, time away from the hot weather. And this one, this is the, the newest of the, the lot of books. It's a, as you can see, it's fairly sizable. It's a very big magician's companion. A practical and encyclopedic guide to magical and religious symbolism by Bill Whitcomb. It's a pretty good book. If you're looking to build a religious and um, magic system into your your stories and general storytelling and I highly recommend this it covers a lot of ground you can look at a bunch of different um, systems in it uh, some of which are actually practiced today which makes it very timely so you've got the I Ching some people still pay attention to the I Ching uh, there's things like the Greek gods um, layman's, I believe they're, they're called. Um, obviously, a lot of symbols, um, pictures of symbols are for this. And at the back, you'll find a wonderful um, a lexicon, which basically explains the terms that are being used throughout the book. Yes, very good. I highly recommend it. And for those who um, are unaware, I originally did this video for um, a little task I, we were asked, uh, the stu uh, fellow students and I were asked to do as part of the Future of Storytelling course uh, is a, a MOOC at iVersity, which is a German MOOC provider. It's, um, it's a great course um, presented by uh, four great people, a bunch of great students. I highly recommend that, that you enroll and, and take a look at the videos if you haven't already done so. The videos will be available for quite some time. The forums are great. There's a lot of discussions that take place there. And I look forward to seeing your comments on this video when I am when I have it uploaded. I'll try to post a um, further a little text on what each of the books that I, I talked about were, so that you can go look for them yourself if you're interested. And I will try to post some more videos in future. Any feedback and comments are greatly appreciated. I do pay attention to them. Um, for the trolls out there, um, not really into that sort of thing, so probably a waste of your time trolling on this particular video. Um, and I guess this is time for me to say farewell. Catch you later.